Let's talk about laboratory testing for COVID-19. First, why are there so many different tests for COVID-19? What are the different tests good for and what are they not good for? Second, are there any tests that can tell us whether someone is immune to COVID-19? And finally, what are clinical labs doing to address the shortage of supplies so that more people can be tested? We're gonna answer each of these questions and more with the help of two experts. Welcome to the first podcast for the Journal of Clinical Microbiology. I'm Alex McAdam, the Editor-in-Chief of JCM. This podcast is supported by the American Society for Microbiology, which publishes the journal. The August issue of JCM is a special issue about diagnostic testing for severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2, the cause of COVID-19. The issue has 20 full-length research papers, a dozen new data letters, six commentaries, and a mini-review. All the other features, including the briefcase, the photo quiz, and an editorial, are about COVID-19. You can find the issue at jcm.asm.org. I'm joined by two expert guests to discuss diagnostic testing for SARS-CoV-2. First, Dr. Melissa Miller, who is the director of both the Clinical Molecular Microbiology Laboratory and the Clinical Microbiology Laboratory at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. Dr. Miller is also an editor of JCM. Welcome, Melissa. I'm glad you could join us. Thank you for having me. We're also joined by Dr. Elitza Thiel, who is the director of the Infectious Diseases Serology Laboratory at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Thiel is a member of the editorial board of JCM. Welcome, Ellie, and thanks for being here. Thank you, happy to be here. Melissa, let's start by talking about polymerase chain reaction and similar tests for SARS-CoV-2. We could call these nucleic acid amplified tests or NATs to include all of the different tests, but we usually just call them PCR after the oldest and most popular of them. Most of these tests work by rever reverse transcribing viral RNA to DNA and then amplifying the DNA log logarithmically and then detecting the amplified product. By far, these are the most common tests for SARS-CoV-2. How did you decide which NATs or PCRs to use in your lab? Well, initially there wasn't much of a choice outside of laboratory developed tests or LDTs as we call them. So when the Secretary of Health and Human Services declared a public health emergency and then FDA had emergency use authorization, um, CLIA laboratories such as ours had to seek FDA EUA prior to implementing an LDT. But by this time, there were several RT-PCR protocols that were available on the WHO website, and many of them even had data associated with them. So we based our decision based upon gene conservation. We quickly had to become uh, pseudo-coronavirus experts. Uh, we also looked at the reputation of the developing laboratory and our experience from SARS-CoV-1. We ultimately, for our LDT, adopted the protocol of the Dresden Lab in Germany and eventually received FDA EUA status. After that, when we started um, implementing commercial tests that had EUA, we were looking at things such as instruments we already had, instruments we could quickly acquire, and kind of the quote unquote promise of how many reagents we could get from the um, different manufacturers and what our potential test capacity would be. So we had to address having tests both with rapid turnaround times as well as those that had high throughput. So it was a combination of these things that led us to our decisions. Thank you. Ellie, I want to ask you about another category of tests, the antigen tests. Like the NATs, these tests detect the virus itself, but they do it by detecting proteins of the virus. They're often cartridge-based tests similar to a home pregnancy test. These have been suggested to have great promise as rapid tests that can be done at the point of care, meaning right in the clinic, doctor's office, or the emergency department. Do you think these tests will deliver on this promise? Yeah, well, um, based on the emerging literature showing that antigen test sensitivity ranges from, in some cases, less than 50% to about 80% or so compared to molecular tests, I'd say that at, at face value, it's not looking too promising right now. Uh, and, and I don't think it's too surprising given our historical experience with antigen tests for other respiratory viruses, which are similarly hampered by issues of low sensitivity. Um, but right now, there are two antigen tests that have received FDA EUA. Both of them detect the nucleocapsid protein. Um, they do use different methods, but overall, compared to the molecular tests, while the specificity of both of those methods is excellent, sensitivity overall is about 80 to 84 percent. And so because of that, the manufacturers recommend confirmatory testing for negative results using a molecular assay. Mm -hmm. 
Interestingly, they do indicate that confirmation is only needed if clinically necessary, but I think that would be the case in the vast majority of situations, particularly for symptomatic patients. And so in, in those cases, the utility of these sorts of antigen tests, I think, really diminishes. Um, there are some caveats to the issue of antigen sensitivity, of course, because we know that with the antigen tests, uh, sensitivity is higher when individuals are tested closer to the uh, time of symptom onset, which does correlate with higher viral loads. But still, even when patients are tested earlier uh, after symptom onset, the sensitivity still doesn't quite approach that of molecular tests. Um, interestingly, though, there's been some discussion on social media and in other outlets for how to use assays like these with lower sensitivity in alternative ways. Uh, which is interesting, especially given the supply chain issues and cost associated with molecular testing. And one of the ideas that's been circulated out there, which to some extent has been uh, based on a preprint modeling study, is that perhaps use of assays with lower sensitivity is okay if, however, these sorts of tests can be done at a much higher frequency, like almost daily, if they're easily accessible and can be done on readily, um, uh, easily uh, collected uh, sample types like saliva, uh, and if they're at low cost. So the idea is that daily testing or testing every day, every other day would potentially pick up active infection during the time when uh, viral loads are, are high and when individuals are most, contag uh, most contagious. I think, I think it's an intriguing concept. You know, we're constantly challenged to think outside of the box, and I think this is one of those uh, thought avenues. Um, I think we're kind of far away from that sort of testing algorithm yet, given the currently available assays. But I do think there's a lot of interest in um, continuing to develop antigen-based assays that can be done uh, even at home. So I do foresee this area really developing and growing over the next few months. Thank you, Ellie. Melissa, as long as we're talking about the point of care tests, can you tell us about the point of care PCR or NATS for the virus? Yeah, so there are two main types of point of care um, NAT-based tests that um, you think about. So one are um, those that are mobile. Mobile platforms are easy to move um, from location to location. These are typically pretty low throughput, depending on how many of them that you have. Um, and that's an example of that's the Abbott ID Now test. There are also more facility-based platforms. An example of that's the Cepheid Gene Expert Express test. And these are often larger, they're not as mobile, and they're still based largely in hospitals, but they still provide rapid results closer to the point of care and usually have higher throughput than the mobile platforms. The key is really that these platforms um, can be used um, without CLIA certification. So under EUA, they could be used in locations with a certificate of waiver or certificate of compliance or accreditation. It's really important to know uh, the performance characteristics of these platforms as they can vary widely. So for example, the Cepheid test performs comparably to very well-described high complexity tests, whereas the Abbott ID Now has been quite a bit in the news about its false negative rate and the range of sensitivity of that test I've seen in the literature as low as 50% to as high as 95%. But most of the data suggests it's around 70 to 80%. Um, the caveat still apply, just like Ellie was talking about, testing more often daily, what types of specimens you're collecting can improve that. But it's important that these are used in the appropriate patient populations. Um, I think getting these mobile platforms um, to areas that are underserved in our country and even having them available to support outbreak investigations. They've been used, for example, in our state um, for some of the meatpacking plant um, outbreaks. So we need more of these coming to market and hopefully um, as more come along, we'll have those with greater sensitivity that are also um, mobile. Thank you. Melissa, one more question about NATS before we move on. There's been a lot of controversy about the reporting of the cycle threshold value or the CT value for SARS-CoV-2 PCR to the clinical staff or in the medical record. The CT value is the number of cycles of PCR or NAT needed to detect the virus, so it reflects the quantity, the level of viral RNA in the original sample. Do you think there are situations in which reporting the CT value is appropriate? 
This has certainly been an area of controversy, um, whether to report CT values or not, whether that's in the medical record or even verbally. And everyone has to decide that for their own institution for sure. My concern is that there are many nuances that fact into the accuracy of a semi-quantitative value like a CT value, a cycle value. So for example, the reproducibility of a CT value can be affected by sample collection or even sample type, uh, transport media, a delay in transport, storage conditions, even the test or the gene within a test um, that's used to detect the RNA. So we see CT values differ greatly between different platforms and many of our labs now are using multiple platforms um, just to achieve the test capacity that we need. So you can't directly compare them one to another. And we see differences as big as 10 cycles or more between platforms. That being said, there are published data to support the potential value in quantitative or semi-quantitative detection of um, SARS-CoV-2 RNA. So for example, multiple publications have shown um, an increase in cycle number and therefore lower viral RNA. Um, with the increase of that, you have the decreased ability to culture the virus. This is partially a sensitivity issue. Um, detecting RNA um, gets to a more sensitive level than being able to culture it. But it also gets to the question, if you can't culture the virus from a sample, is it transmissible? Also with progression of disease course, the cycles increase over time. And by eight to 10 days of symptom onset, you can no longer culture the virus from a respiratory sample, even though the PCR will remain positive at higher cycle numbers at that time. This becomes really important for infection control policies and even for discharging patients. We've had patients that were PCR positive for weeks to now we even have one over three months that won't be accepted by a congregate living setting just because they're positive and this positive result is in the chart. But when you look at the CT values, there's a gross difference in their original CT value um, and the one that they have now is usually just over the limit of detection. So this is taking up um, needed beds in our hospitals, but it's also delaying reuniting these patients with their family members and getting them the long-term care that we need. We can't forget the human aspect of this whole pandemic. So while we've not historically used cycle numbers for respiratory infections, there does seem to be some correlation with viral load um, on presentation and disease severity. Although I'll admit more research is needed in this area because even asymptomatic people can have very high viral loads. There also may be a need for some sort of semi-quantitative or quantitative test, um, particularly with clinical trials um, for new um, treatments for COVID-19 um, or to monitor response for therapy. So um, we need more data on this, but I think there is some value hidden within all the PCRs that we're doing. Thank you. It's very helpful. Ellie, let's talk about the last major category of tests for COVID-19, the serology or antibody tests. Unlike PCR or the antigen tests, these tests detect the immune response against SARS-CoV-2. Why is that difference important? So the, the difference is important because detecting an immune response or antibodies to the virus does not tell you whether or not the individual is actively infected at the time of testing. So we know that antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 are detectable in the majority of individuals 10 to 14 days or so after symptom onset. And although emerging data are suggesting that they decline over time, they are detectable still for at least 10 to 8 to 10 weeks and, and likely longer. Um, although we're, you know, those longitudinal studies are really still being done. So given those antibody kinetics, generally speaking, a negative antibody result would indicate no prior infection unless you were recently infected within the last week or so. Uh, and so, and then on the flip side, a positive result may indicate recent infection or it might indicate infection at some point in the past. So given those general um, caveats with antibody testing, unlike with PCR or antigen-based methods, we can't really rely on antibody tests to diagnose active or even recent COVID-19. Thank you, Ellie. And I'll ask you both, but I won't ask you the result. Have you been tested? Have you had an antibody test? I have had an antibody test for research purposes only. <laughs> How about you, Melissa? I have not had an antibody test, but I've actually had a lot of RNA te tests for research yeah. use only. I have been tested by RNA twice and antibody once. All right. Um, Ellie, you and your colleagues had a really great article in the issue of JCM, and it was called 
the role of antibody testing for SARS-CoV-2. Is there one? Can you answer the question posed in the title for us? <laughs> well, um, I'd say that the role of antibody testing will likely evolve during this pandemic. Um, generally speaking, right now, I'd say that, you know, serologic testing, antibody testing has a really limited utility at the individual patient level, uh, again, for the reasons we just talked about, and because the presence of antibodies has not really been definitively correlated with immunity against reinfection. Um, I think there's some emerging data out there from rhesus macaque studies suggesting that there's at least some short-term uh, protective immunity generated after that initial primary infection. Um, uh, but, but how that translates to humans and how long such immunity lasts, I think, really still remains unknown. And until we better understand that relationship, I don't really think there are any clinical actions that can be made based on an antibody test result alone. Uh, so we really can't make any changes to our social distancing practices or whether or not we use masks or any other personal protective equipment based on a positive or a negative antibody result. Um, so, so right now, antibody testing, I think, is really most useful for screening of potential convalescent plasma donors in support of the national clinical trials for convalescent plasma. Um, they are also uh, invaluable for seroprevalence and seroprevalence studies, looking at how the virus is spreading in our communities. Um, they're useful for research and, and also for assessment of our immune response uh, in, in vaccine recipients and in all the vaccine clinical trials that are ongoing right now. Thank you, Willie. Melissa, as you know, of course, the usual way of collecting a sample for respiratory virus testing is to collect a nasopharyngeal swab sample. The swab then goes into transport media to preserve the virus while it's sent to the lab for testing. During the COVID-19 pandemic, both the swabs and the transport media have been very difficult to get due to shortages. What have people done so they can continue to test for SARS-CoV-2 despite these shortages? The efforts of my colleagues in microbiology and supply chain, um, and tirelessly looking for and evaluating and validating new swabs and transport media throughout all, of, uh, throughout all of this has been truly inspiring and quite honestly exhausting. I've never self-collected so many swabs in all of my life to check out how well they, uh, how, how they feel, how they break off, um, even how they perform in the tests that we're doing. So in some situations where NP swabs just, you could not get them, institutions had to switch to alternative um, sites of collection that could use thicker swabs, such as nasal swabs or throat swabs. Um, we also had to start looking at complete um, swabless approaches, such as nasal or throat washes or saliva. We have validated all of those in our laboratory. Fortunately, haven't had to use much beyond nasal washes here, but I do know other institutions um, have had to go at least for a while with swabless-based approaches. So while many of the non-nasopharyngeal non options are less sensitive than the NP swab, the public health message really is clear that these tests at alternative sites are better than not being able to test at all. As long as the messaging is clear on the performance of the test for the source being used. So then it's known what the false negative rate is, how quickly you might have to retest the patient, um, any confirmatory testing that might need to be done. For transport media, um, here at UNC and I know other places as well, we had to quickly um, validate and switch to phosphate buffered saline instead of um, universal transport media or VTM. And we did this back in the flu pandemic, so we were kind of ready to go with that um, and had data at least um, on other RNA viruses that this worked quite well. What was really helpful is early in the pandemic, um, Matt Benneker's group from Mayo published a paper in JCM showing the equivalency of several different easy to obtain alternative media, including saline, and got that out very quickly for labs um, to be able to have alternative ways um, of where how to put their swabs and transport them to the lab. So many of us are even making our own collection kits now. We have a whole factory back in the lab of getting dry swabs and making PBS tubes and putting them together in collection kits. And um, it's it's been quite, quite the ride. So we're just doing what we have to do to keep collecting and keep testing. Yeah, we, we pivoted to saline very early on as well, and it was a, it was a big help. It, of those different sample types, uh, anterior nares, nasal wash, throat, 
uh, oropharyngeal, which do you think are the most promising or is it too early to say? I think it's too early to say, and I do think it depends on the patient population. Are you doing asymptomatic screening? Are you testing um, symptomatic patients in the very acute period? There are different approaches you can um, use to do that. To me, the most um, promising, and it has met some of our gaps are, that I haven't mentioned yet, are 3D printed collection devices. So sticking with the nasopharynx, that we know is the best site of collection, particularly in the acute phase of disease, early in symptom onset. Um, the, the, this seems to be very promising just based upon the sheer scalability of production that can be done. And so this is an opportunity that we have had to look outside of the box, thinking about things we haven't had to think about before and really give things a shot that we kind of thought, oh, this will never work. This looks terrible. It doesn't look like a swab. Well, you're right. It doesn't look like a swab. Um, but also um, in JCM colleagues, um, some of yours at Beth Israel Deaconess published a very nice description of the development and validation of 3D printed collection devices. I don't usually call these swabs because they really aren't swabs. Um, and you really have to carefully assess these, both from the perspective of how they perform in the test, but also the comfort of the patient. These are some that I tried on myself. They're pretty uncomfortable, actually. Um, the ease of collection and getting them into transport containers back into the lab. How are you going to sterilize them and package them? A lot of other nuances you have to think about. We've seen a wide variety of these 3D printed devices, some of which very clearly were not going to be suitable. But the companies that are working on these are, are easily able to change the pattern at which they're printing and modify it. Um, you just tell them you want this longer, you want this thicker, you want the break point here. And the next thing you know, you have something FedExed in the mail the next day to look at. So um, that to me is the most promising. And I know labs have implemented these. We haven't had to use 3D printed swabs yet um, and they have been successful with them. So that, I think that is a potential positive that, that came out of the, the collection crisis. Crisis. Thank you. And people can find that paper by Dr. Remy Arnaud on JCM's website, uh, and it is open access, as are all of our COVID-19 papers. Uh, Ellie, because of the need to rapidly offer and scale up testing for COVID-19, the FDA took some unusual approaches to regulating these tests. Can you tell us how the FDA regulation of serology tests for COVID-19 has changed over time? Sure. So initially, serologic tests fell under FDA's Pathway D for COVID-19 testing, where manufacturers were encouraged but not required to submit validation data for emergency use authorization of their assay. And the reason behind that decision was because antibody tests aren't considered diagnostic assays. Uh, they were intended by the FDA to be used just for seroprevalence studies and were to be performed in CLIA certified labs after appropriate validation and verification. Um, and then they also required that labs performing these tests included certain information on their reports regarding the limitation of uh, serologic testing. Um, so unlike for molecular tests, there was really quite a bit of um, regulatory leniency early on for serologic assays, which led to really a rapid influx of over 200 serologic tests on the market at one point for COVID-19, uh, which I think is more antibody tests for SARS-CoV-2 than for any other infectious agent. It was really quite, um, quite incredible. Uh, unfortunately, though, not all of those assays performed well, and so in early May, the FDA updated their regulations to essentially require that manufacturers submit their validation data for emergency use authorization. Um, they also uh, put together and released um, specific uh, performance thresholds that had to be met for the uh, test to be considered um, appropriate for use. And they set up a streamlined process for independent evaluation of products, primarily ELISAs and lateral flow assays. Uh, and that was done through the National um, Cancer Institute. And then uh, finally, they now list a, uh, all of the serologic test kits on their website, which either did not meet those performance characteristics or for which the manufacturer did not submit uh, validation data. And uh, they specifically indicate that those test kits should not be distributed or used in the US. And I think 
I think there's over 65 of them now. So I'd say that the FDA has really tried to t uh, tighten the reins in on serologic testing over the last few months, um, given the backlash and, and influx of some really poor quality tests on the market. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, Melissa, you and your colleagues have a commentary titled Understanding, Verifying, and Implementing Emergency Use Authorization in Molecular Diagnostics for the Detection of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the August issue of JCM. Can you briefly tell us how the FDA regulated PCR or NAT for SARS-CoV-2? And can you tell us how the FDA's approach to regulation affected the availability of these tests? Sure. So the intent of the public health emergency declaration um, that happened in early February and then the enactment of FDA EUA emergency use authorization is to strengthen public health protections in a time of uncertainty like the pandemic. It's also to facilitate um, rapid availability and use of things like diagnostics, drugs, vaccines, equipment during these public health emergencies. The reality of it was the effect was um, it, it handicapped many labs early on that had the ability to develop and validate laboratory developed tests under CLIA. Um, Many of us were developing these, ready to go live with these, um, knew about the EUA process, um, but would have to submit for review and wait for that review before we could offer testing to patients. Um, the delay in the distribution of the CDC test, in addition to this, led to a gross lag in testing capability in the US. So many of our labs had never gone through an FDA process such as this and understandably were intimidated um, and didn't submit initially. Thankfully, um, later in February, the FDA modified its guidance for CLIA labs and provided a streamlined application for emergency use authorization. And at that point, they also allowed us to start testing pending EUA authorization and review. That's really when we started seeing testing um, begin in laboratories. But by this point, you're talking about early to mid-March. Um, we saw a lot of increase in LDTs in the U.S. at that time, but there's a limited throughput of those tests. Um, within a couple of weeks, commercial EUAs became available um, for, for many laboratories based upon that same um, guidance that came out in late February. But the lag of testing that was created through all of this was really detrimental to many areas of the country who were already having community spread of the virus and didn't know it because we didn't have um, testing available. Thank you. Um, and one last question for you, you Melissa, or really two questions together. There's been a lot of discussion recently about a couple of strategies to increase the capacity for SARS-CoV-2 testing. The first of those is pooling of samples or combining several samples together and then testing that pool. Um, and then the second strategy is performing initial testing for SARS-CoV-2 in a research laboratory. If the results from the research lab were negative, those would be final results, but positive results would need to be confirmed in an accredited clinical laboratory. What are your thoughts about each of those two strategies? This really is a loaded question <laughs> or questions. Uh, these are very hot topics right now. Just before this podcast, I got off a state call talking about pooling algorithms. Uh, so we'll start with that. This is not a new concept for us in the clinical lab. It's been used in the STI world for CT and GNATs, even HIV testing to detect acute HIV cases. We did this in our laboratory for years prior to the combination test being available. I personally personally think that pooling may be the best strategy, although admittedly imperfect, going forward to help with the supply chain issues we're dealing with daily and honestly sometimes hourly. Manufacturers simply cannot keep up with the demand for the RNA test that we have. Um, in the beginning, we had a little bit of reprieve in the middle, but now we're back to really needing to increase and continue to test at the capacities we are, and we're not being able to get these supplies. So it's important to use this pooling strategy only in low prevalence settings or populations and less than 5% is a number that has been recommended. We've chosen to be more conservative and look at something like one or less than one. So this is gonna be the asymptomatic um, patient population for most of us. You can also adjust the pool size based on prevalence. So you're only breaking down a min minimum number of positive pools Analytic sensitivity is necessarily impacted with pooling and the scope of the impact is dependent on the size of the pool. But remember, 
we're talking about PCR here, an amplification process. So a pool of five specimens in the context of PCR is really only going to change the CT value of about two. So only very low positives um, might be impacted, and we still don't know what's truly significant about these low positives, assuming they were appropriately collected. Um, the alternative is we're not able to test low prevalent populations at all. And I think a lot of our institutions are struggling with these decisions um, today. We do need to get emergency use authorization as of today for pooling strategies. So it's not something you can say, oh, we're not getting enough kits this week, let's start pooling. So be aware that there are um, regulations on that as well. So we'll move on to maybe a little bit more difficult of a conversation in terms of research lab setting. I know in the early days of the pandemic, pandemic and even maybe still now, we were all inundated with um, our research colleagues and wanting to help. What can we do to help? We can do PCR. Everybody wanted to help. And this certainly was immensely appreciated. But the regulated environment of the clinical lab is very different than that of the research lab. And so this has become more controversial in terms of thinking about research lab potentially doing testing. But I do think there's a safe path forward in some situation. This testing capacity problem has been constant from the beginning. Um, as cases rise again, we're at a critical point. Um, and, and honestly, one of our reagents we will run out of today. So I don't think this is going to go away until the virus goes away. So clinical labs are not able to do all the testing that's being requested of them. Um, and many of our hospitals are associated with a research university or are close to one. And so I think those are uniquely poised to work um, with, uh, use their expertise and work with the university side to aid in testing capacity. I'm not talking about um, testing clinical patients, symptomatic patients, doing them through a research lab. So please don't send me any hate mail about this or call me. Don't you. definitely be done by CLIA certified laboratories. Um, although I will note there are examples of research labs who have obtained CLIA certification and that has been some even during this pandemic. But for large scale asymptomatic surveillance testing, so we're talking about the students that potentially are coming back in the fall, faculty, staff, even in communities, um, this can be a function of true research, but also um, work to inform public health. Um, research labs are often using lab developed tests. The one that we are working here um, with at, at UNC, um, it's the CDC test. That protocol is published, the primers are published. So it's not different than many of the tests that, that we have in our labs. And so we're not largely competing for the same commercial reagent, EUA commercial reagents at this point. Tips and extraction kits, that's another story um, that should be a concern for us. Um, as mentioned, positives could be referred to testing by a CLIA laboratory. Um, but what I would encourage our listeners to, particularly clinical microbiologists that are listening, don't shun the offer of research labs to assist with capacity in this manner. I think it's really important that we as board certified clinical microbiologists um, and those of us with clinical testing expertise help guide research labs aiming to do this testing. We need to educate them about processes, controls, and contamination. We can also offer to help in quality monitor uh, in helping them develop a qual quality monitoring system for the results coming out of their lab. Um, and we are doing this um, in collaboration with the Dittmer lab at, at UNC. Um, it's also um, important to know we can't stop testing at this point. We clearly need help and the testing burden cannot rest solely on the clinical and public health labs. And I'll point listeners to a New York Times op-ed that Drs. Patel and Bertuzzi wrote the president and CEO of, of ASM at the time of the writing, um, that we need a new kind of National Guard in these situations. And they were proposing the idea of a National Guard of microbiologists to come together to help meet the testing needs of a pandemic. And I certainly um, agree with um, something else needs to be done because we cannot do it on our own. And Melissa, you, you mentioned offers of uh, researchers and other folks to come in and, and help in the laboratory. Did you take anybody up on those offers? 
Um, we did, um, this was in conjunction with our Center for AIDS Research. We not only took some of their personnel to help us with testing, we actually took one of their instruments and had it moved from the CIFAR core to our um, CLIA lab, and it's still in our CLIA lab, and one of their techs is still working in our lab. We have lots of volunteers that are helping think people that can't do the actual testing in the laboratory, and, and what you can do is going to partly depend on your state. Um, we have them making kits for us and pipetting PBS and there's lots of other aspects of the process that we can take um, uh, the offers for help. They really want to help and we really need the help. So I think we should try to integrate them as much as possible. Ellie, did anything like that happen at your institution? Did you have additional people coming in to help out in the lab or help make supplies, those kinds of things? Yeah, so um, Mayo Clinic uh, laboratories, the reference lab practice, as you can imagine, the volumes really did plummet for, for a while. So we had a lot of staff available that could be redeployed to laboratories that uh, needed support for COVID testing. Uh, so we had um, close to 100 individuals, uh, if, if not more at this point, um, transition to testing, doing molecular testing as well as serologic testing to support uh, COVID uh, activities. Yeah. In our own lab, we had a lot of offers for uh, help. Uh, people wanted to really come in and give us a hand, but we ended up just taking help from some very qualified uh, technologists who were in our department of pathology who already were familiar with molecular testing, and they really helped us out quite a bit. All right, last question for each of you. Um, Ellie, first you. What is one thing you wish you had known at the start of this pandemic? Well, uh, one thing that uh, really caught me off guard, especially in the beginning, was the level of attention and scrutiny and demand that was generated for antibody testing for COVID-19. Um, I don't, maybe I was naive, but while I expected that for molecular testing, since that's how we routinely diagnose respiratory viruses, I really didn't expect that sort of attention to be placed on antibody testing. Um, I think that was there partly because of a lot of misunderstanding about what antibody testing can and cannot tell us, and um, in, to some level, some premature promotion of that testing. So it kind of felt like being hit by a truck. Um, I don't know if knowing that at the start of, pan of the pandemic would have been helpful necessarily. Um, maybe I would have brushed up on my initially non-existent media speaking skills, but uh, yeah, it was a bit of a shock to the system since antibody testing doesn't really generate a lot of interest um, typically in the public. <laughs> Thank you, Ellie. And how about you, Melissa? What do you wish you had known? I wish I had known to retire early and start an online Etsy shop or something. I think I'd be much happier. Although I think I, I would be missing out on um, kind of having clinical microbiology in the lab in general, finally getting the attention that we deserve 24 seven. You had a, a comic that addressed that, that was um, very applicable. But seriously, I do think I wish I had understood more about supply chain in general. And this sounds crazy coming out of my mouth, but just the whole process and how complicated it is and that how truly broken the supply chain is. Now, while knowing that I wouldn't have been able to completely mitigate the impact of these shortages, um, but I do think I would have diversified even more um, than we did in the beginning. So we have four different pl testing platforms. Maybe I would have 10 different plus testing platforms and hire a lot more lab techs in the beginning and week one instead of steadily um, hiring them throughout the pandemic. Although I'm not sure we would have actually found the people or the space to put all of this um, uh, at the time anyway, but we still would have had many challenges to overcome. But in retrospect, I think I would have diversified a bit more earlier. Um, I know you only asked for one thing, but I think this is a really important aspect is I think I, I would have liked to have known uh, the mental health aspect of this, how hard it was going to be for our labs, for all of us, for everyone trying to get us supplies. Um, it's really been an opportunity for institutions and for colleagues to come together and share what they're doing and really um, help each other through this process. And that's something I have appreciated about this process. Um, but I think early on, had I known the drain on all of our mental health, I might have um, tried to protect it a little bit earlier than, um, than now. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, thank you, Melissa. That's very helpful. Um, I'll provide my own answer to this, and and you have both provided answers from the laboratory side. So I'll put on my uh, editor's hat and uh, say that I wish I had known how JCM would be affected by the pandemic. The volume of submissions to the journal more than doubled in just a few months, and there were just a tremendous number of papers coming in, and it was extremely challenging to uh, run the lab, uh, run a safety committee that I also run, and then uh, make sure that papers were being dealt with um, in an appropriate fashion. So we had to reconfigure the workflow. And Melissa, you saw this live. We had to reconfigure the workflow several times for the manuscripts, but I am really proud of where we ended up. I think we ended up getting the right papers into the journal, and I think we've got some really good stuff. Well, thank you both for a great conversation. I've enjoyed this very much, and I think the listeners have too. Uh, you can learn more, listeners, about testing for COVID-19 in the special issue of the Journal of Clinical Microbiology at jcm.asm.org. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Alex.